how do you follow up on what you consider the most perfect hit you've ever committed? For Dennis, he sits down and writes about Rex committing the most perfect hit, refining each detail until the entire scene is flawless. Through his storytelling, he is able to go back and revisit over and over until he has played that version out and in desperate need of more material. But when life gets in the way, two kids, a wife, a full-time position with ADT, and committed to completing his bachelor's in criminology, it leaves him with even less time to stock a target. Instead, he puts on women's clothing using pieces that he took from the homes of his victims, dons a plastic mask with hideous makeup, and ties himself up posing in different positions, allowing himself to fantasize over and over about what he would do to a victim if she were in his place. When Dennis went out in search of sexual release, he threw investigators for a loop and stalked a woman nearly double the age of his eldest female victim, Julie Otero, who was 34. Anna Williams' dosy doe circled to the left and promenaded around the dance floor while BTK's timeline slowly ticked away. Eager for another kill, Dennis would end up waiting an additional six years before an opportunity presented itself, and she was closer to the home than he would like. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we continue on in the case of Wichita, Kansas' most prolific serial killer, BTK. The calendar rolls by. Each day, Dennis Rader lives the life of a family man. A son running around nearly three years old and now a beautiful new daughter at home means he has to find other ways to satisfy himself sexually. As one of the leaders at Christ Lutheran Church, a church his family was growing up in, a crew leader at his job at ADT, and a student by night, Dennis's schedule seems to be full, but he'll pencil in another kill just when investigators thought that BTK had been caught or killed. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of sexual fantasies, perversions, torture, murder, and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, all of my true crime nerds. Before we get started, let's do a little bit of housekeeping for tonight. I want to start off with a huge, big shout out and thank you to Miss Shelley. She became the first nerd to head over to the new website and donate to the show to help keep it up and running. Shelley, truly thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for your support. I couldn't be more appreciative. We have a few other true crime nerds that went out of their way to give some honest reviews and recommendations. We have Southern Dolly. Ski VRMT, Jenna Evans, and Matthew Pike. If you'd like to make it to the growing list of love to my true crime nerds, help the show out by way of review, recommendation, or hitting that donate button on the new website. Feel free to reach out to me either on Facebook or Instagram, or maybe even the new website at, at www the true crime librarian.com with any questions feedback new cases or maybe some suggestions to help out the show i love interacting with you all and do my very best to get back to each and every one of you who make a recommendation or a review or a comment or a question it is important that you feel important to me don't forget to follow The Librarian on your favorite social media platform and podcast platform. 
If you're joining me on my YouTube channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and then click on that notification bell so you never miss an upload. Last but definitely not least, keep an eye out in the coming month of February for some new twists from the librarian. All right, that's enough of that. Let's get to why you all are here this evening, and that is the true crime. When I last left you, we were looking at BTK committing what he considered his most perfect hit with Nancy Fox, and that was on December 8th of 1977. And tonight we start just 15 months later on April 28th of 1979. Now, when I say 15 months, it's been 15 months since the last letter from BTK was sent over to the KAKE TV station. Dennis, at this point, has found a new woman and he's ready to kill again. It's been 15 months and things are starting to back up for him. On June 13th of 1978, Dennis and his wife Paula welcomed their second child, Carrie Rader. This was part of the reason he went on a hiatus for so long. New child meant he had all new duties and responsibilities at home and going out and stalking wasn't feasible. So he, he went dormant again. Dennis's ability to go months and even years between kills is something that still draws all of us in. It's completely fascinating, and I know I keep saying that on repeat for each episode, but I cannot stress enough what kind of anomaly this is. For Dennis to be able to shut off the serial killer side of him is so rare that it needs to be studied because he's not the only one out there who can go this long in between killings without losing his mind. Now with the new victim, Dennis, he continued to play the same old excuse. He was going to go to the library. He had some studying to do. He was just fixing to wrap up his last year at WSU and earn his bachelor's degree in criminology. So Dennis went to the library, quote, quote, and instead, really, he headed over to the 600 block of Pinecrest and parked away from the new victim's home. He snuck around the back. He clipped out her phone line, something that he identifies almost the moment he decides to start stalking someone. He figures out where their phone line is. That's his signature. That's saying... I'm here and you're not going to get out of this. So he made sure of it when he began stalking that he knew exactly where that phone line was so it could be clipped. Once he had the phone line clipped, he heads over to a small window in the basement where he decides he's going to enter the home. And he tapes the window and he breaks out the window. Now this not only quiets the, the sound of glass shattering, but it also keeps a whole lot of shards from going everywhere and becoming very obvious that somebody had entered in through this way. Now, as Dennis is climbing through this window, he is so hopeful that the young girl he's seen coming and going a few times that he's been stalking this new victim, he's like, please be home because then, then I get two kills. But he gets in the house, he creeps upstairs, and he figures out there's nobody home. So, once he's in the house, he decides he's going to go through the home and start looking for things that fit what we call his code. And that's scarves, nylons, jewelry. He loves to take jewelry, give it to his wife, and then he has gratification when she wears it. So he t he's looking for jewelry. He's looking for other trophies. The anticipation of this happening and possibly having two victims has completely skyrocketed Dennis and his adrenaline. So he's going through the house. He's digging through things. He's not making sure that if, you know, when the new victim comes home that she won't immediately identify that somebody's been in the house. 
because at this point he doesn't care. He's hoping that when she comes home, she has that young girl with her. Now, we learn later that Anna was recently widowed. She had just lost her husband a few months prior. And her daughter and granddaughter would be visiting her quite frequently as she adjusts to living by herself. So the younger women that he saw coming in and out of the home was really Anna Williams, 24-year-old granddaughter. Let me introduce you to Anna Williams. Anna Williams is 63 years old. Like I said, she lives at home. She's recently a widow. Her daughter and granddaughter have helped her transition in this dark time, dark season of her life. And Anna is just now getting out and, and doing things for herself. Before she was a wife, she was devoted. She raised her family. She has these grandkids and then, then life hit her and she lost her husband. On this particular night, Anna, she's out square dancing. So Dennis decides, I'm already in the home. I'm just going to wait. So he tucks himself down in one of the closets in Anna's home. This is something he did when he was waiting for Nancy Fox to come home as well. And with Kathy Bright. So he gets himself into the closet, settles himself in, and he starts to play the waiting game. And as the minutes tick by, Dennis's alibi, Dennis's excuse of being at the library, leaves him very little time to actually play with Anna when she gets there. For each moment she's not home, Dennis loses a moment of gratification. Okay, so when 10 o'clock rolls around and Dennis is still sitting in this closet and nobody's home, he's out of time. He can't. There's the library's closing. If he does not go home now, Paula's going to start questioning him on where he's going or where he's been. What's he doing? And he cannot have her in his business. He needs to be able to separate being a family man and being a serial killer. So Dennis buys the bullet, gets out of the closet, goes and exits the house the same way he entered, gets in his car and goes home. At 11 p.m., Anna Williams comes home, walks into her home, and immediately realizes somebody has been there. Her jewelry is scattered across her dresser. The drawers inside of her dresser have been pulled out, raffled through, and there was a sock that she had been stashing money in and had about $35, which at that time is quite a bit of money. It's gone. And then the big telltale was the spare bedroom door was open and she knew she closed that before she left the home that night. So Anna goes over, picks up the phone and the blood drains from her face. She almost can't make her feet move fast enough because... The phone line's dead. Anna gets herself out of the house and gets over to her next door neighbor where they call 911. This event completely and utterly terrifies Anna. She recently lost her husband. She's already feeling vulnerable. She's, she's just not used to living on her home. And to come home to something like this is petrifying. And for Anna, she's going to let it rule her and her life from this point forward. Now, once investigators get over to the home and they see that the phone line's been cut and they start looking around and they notice something super alarming right next to Anna's bed because Dennis had left behind a length of wire. Immediately, investigators knew she was an intended target for BTK. And why he didn't stick around and kill her is the most baffling part of this. Because investigators knew from a line from the letter to KAKE TV, it sticks out to them once they find that wire. Because it said, quote, number eight, next victim, maybe you will find her hanging with a wire noose. So this piece of wire next to Anna Williams' bed immediately they're like BTK was here and why he's not here and why he didn't get her they don't know because in studying 
serial killers of their time. We've got Bundy, who's active. They don't walk away from something like this. It's not in their DNA. They are not programmed to be able to have this much self-control. Yet, Dennis does. And he proves it to us time and time and time again. His self-control, it has to be the most sought-after self-control in anybody in the world. Because to have something this demanding, have something in you that the desire becomes so great that taking another human being's life, well, that's nothing in comparison. Naturally, most of us, most of my listeners, most of my nerds, most of my friends, my family, we don't have this monster in our head. We have no idea what kind of words and venom is spat trying to get that person to go and commit a crime just so they can get this high of endorphins and and sexual gratification and there's a release that happens when they take the life away from somebody else it's a god complex to a degree we've heard that because if you watch any medical show i don't care any medical show at some point they accuse one of the doctors or nurses of having a God complex, controlling who lives and who dies. And for serial killers, that God complex is tenfold. There's not a doctor out there that that has anything on a serial killer. They want to control this. And that control is what sets them and sends them over the edge and gives them the rush and gives them the high that they chase time and time again. It is an addictive thing because you want to feel exactly how you felt the very first time you did it. That is what drives people to become addicts. No matter, and not addicts of drugs, uh, not, you know, alcoholics, addicts of anything. Because you can get that kind of, that kind of rush with drinking caffeine, with smoking a cigarette, with your very first sexual experience that was enjoyable with anything, food, whatever. In the end, the reason you keep doing it over and over is because you're chasing the way you felt the very first time you did it. And for Dennis, that's all he wants. And what he found when he killed the Oteros was something that was almost terrifying to himself. And when he couldn't cash in on that with Kathy Bright and her brother Kevin, he was devastated and crazy enough to keep seeking it out so he could do it again. And Nancy, Nancy Fox gave him exactly what he wanted. There was no struggle. She, she was, she was like, you know, you want to defile me, defile me, hurry up so I can call the cops. And he was able to control that situation from start to finish. It was perfect. So the high he had with the Oterios has now been superseded with Nancy Fox. And that's what he wanted with Anna Williams. She was a widow. Nine times out of ten, she was at home by herself. He only had to control one victim. And he learned with Nancy Fox that if he just had one victim maybe two female victims, he could control the situation enough that he wouldn't have to chase somebody around the house once they broke loose and he didn't have to shoot anybody or stab wildly. He wanted to be able to be up close and personal as he took the very last breath from these women. Investigators also find a wooden broomstick handle, and this does not come into play until later because Dennis is going to gloat. Now, other than these items, Dennis left behind nothing to identify who he was or how to stop him. And why would he? He didn't have a chance to commit this murder. 
He had to get out of there. He had sat in that closet. What was he going to leave behind? There was no sexual release that happened at this crime scene. There's no DNA to, to pick up from. There's no sweat. There's no blood. There's no altercation. There's nothing. He, at this point, was some weirdo who broke into a female's home, rifled through her underwear drawer, took her sock money, and left. Although we know the person who did all of that is the man that everybody in Wichita, Kansas feared. But at the end of the day, he had nothing. On June 14th of 1979, Dennis was waiting downtown at the, the post office. It's like 4 a.m. And when the clerk who is coming up, who is who's going to open the post office that morning, he shoves this package to her and says, put this in the K-A-K-E box, turns around, walks off. Now, what the clerk doesn't realize is he's already sent a package similar to this to Anna Williams. Now, later, the clerk will describe him as a man, clean shaven, white, approximately five foot nine inches tall. He's around 30 years of age. He was dressed in a jean jacket, blue jeans, and gloves. His hair was cropped above his ears, and he had gaps between his teeth. Now, like I said, later we find out Dennis mailed a similar package to Anna Williams. Dennis decided that she needed to know who exactly was in her home that night and what could have happened had she come home in time. Anna's package was addressed with block letters and inside he had also put a scarf and a piece of jewelry. Both of these are items that Dennis took the night he was waiting for her to come home. Along with that was a sketch of a woman gagged nude, except for some stockings. She was lying on the edge of the bed and her hands and feet were bound behind her to the stick in a similar fashion to what safari hunters or hog hunters do when the game is too big for two people to carry it. They tie it up against this long wood post, whatever branch, whatever they can tie it to. And that way it lays on the shoulder of the man in the front and the shoulder of the man in the back. And you d evenly disperse the weight of the, the game, the animal. That is the way this, this drawing is detailed. It is graphic. You can get online. You can look it up um, if you're just that curious. I try to be as descriptive as I can because it's... To me, I don't get the entire story until I can put a picture to it. So when I do research, I research all the way down to the nitty gritty. Do I always pass along the nitty gritty? No, because I'm pretty sure, you know, the FCC would come in and shut me down because uh, it would get it would get graphic. Along with the drawing was a poem that was dedicated to Anna. However, it's chock full of poor grammar and even worse spelling mistakes. When reading this, it is quite difficult to decipher what Dennis is trying to say. It does not matter what his communication is, whether it's letter or poem or even a phone call. You can tell there is some form of illiteracy in him. Now, don't get me wrong. He went on to get a bachelor's degree in criminology. He is not a dumb man. However, the way he speaks through writing makes him sound completely incompetent. Here's the poem Anna received. Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? T'was perfect plan of deviant pleasure so bold on the spring night. My inner feeling hot with propension of new awakening season. Warm, wet with inner fear and rapture. My pleasure of entanglement like new vines so tight. Oh, a why didn't you appear? Drop of fear, fresh spring rain would roll down from your nakedness to scent the lofty fever that burns within. In that a small world of longing, 
fear, rapture, and desperation, the games we play fall on devil's ears. Fantasy spring forth, mounts to storm fury, then winter clan at the end. O.A., why didn't you appear? Alone, now in another time span, I lay with sweet enrapture garments across most private thought. Bed of spring moist grass, clean before the sun, enslaved with control, warm wind scenting the air, sunlight sparkle, tears and eyes so deep and clear. Alone again, I trodden past memory of mirrors and ponder why you, number eight, was not. O.A., why didn't you appear? Whether investigators were right and Dennis was after the 24-year-old granddaughter or after Anna, it didn't matter because Anna wasn't going to wait around and figure out what his next move was. She packed up and hauled ass out of Wichita, Kansas as fast as she could. She was not willing to give him another chance. What was something that stood out to investigators by the communication from BTK to both KA, KE, TV, and Anna Williams was the poem and the graphic drawing, both of which were photocopies. And as a matter of fact, when looking back at all of BTK's communication, aside from the very first one, he had photocopied everything following. What he failed to realize is the rollers inside of a copy machine, they leave what's called a tool mark. And this tool mark is unique to the machine as fingerprints are to people. Eventually, Wichita PD, they turned to Xerox experts and it's determined that Dennis used the downtown library's copy machine for the letter to Anna Williams. And he definitely used the life science copier at WSU. This raised the question, is BTK a WSU student? Hindsight, he is. He is currently working on a criminology bachelor's degree. If that ain't some shenanigans, I don't know what is. Now, for Dennis, he, he used his resources appropriately. Um, you can never trace anything back to ADT. Uh, he, you can to WSU, and that's just because he didn't realize photocopiers left this toll mark. And even at my job, if, if things start to get dirty, your toner starts to get, like the toner waste starts to get too full, we start to see that toll mark come out on copies. And that's how you know that your machine needs to be cleaned, because those tool marks are very prominent. However, for an expert who looks at tool marks on copy machines, like the Xerox experts, they're able to identify where those tool marks are from simply by somebody going down and making a photocopy. And that's what Wichita PD did. They went around to every place that had a public photocopier and made a copy, brought that back, and they examined tool marks and things and how everything lined up. And that's how they did this. It's the same way that they identified fingerprints back in 1979. They go and somebody literally goes ridge by ridge and finds markings that are unique to the fingerprint. And then we start bringing in the samples and they start, start to compare. Same concept. It's 1979. We don't have CODIS. There's not a machine looking at these ridges and identifying these markers. It's a human being setting down and looking at fingerprint after fingerprint after fingerprint or toll mark after toll mark. Now, on August 15th of 1979, police decide to do something um, a little brazen and definitely out of character for the investigation. They release a clip of Dennis calling in the murder of Nancy Fox. And why? Because it is very clear during that 911 call that there is an enunciation difference in the way Dennis pronounces homicide. Now, I'm from the South. 
like you don't already know, because I'm sure my accent is coming out, but we say homicide, H-O-M-I-C-I-D-E, right? However, Dennis pronounced it homicide. He said, I would like to report a homicide, not homicide. This triggers uh, hundreds of phone calls to come into the tip hotline that they had set up. And in the end, nothing really pans out. Let's move on to April 26th of 1985. Nearly six years to the date since Dennis Reader had attempted to add another victim to his ever-growing list. Again, Dennis has selected another victim. This time, she matches up with Anna Williams in the sense that they don't match his victimology. The other thing about this new victim is she lives houses away from him. Yes, houses away from Dennis Rader. He decides he's going to kill somebody within his own neighborhood. This new victim lives at 6254 Independent Street in Park City. Park City is a suburb of Wichita, Kansas. Dennis Rader and his family lived at 6220 Independent Street in Park City. Again, he is going against any previous profile or victimology because so far, all of his victims to now have been within the Wichita city limits. With Dennis only living doors away, he is committing what I would call a very ballsy move. Because for him to kill within his neighborhood, it could most definitely be the thing to end his reign of terror, if he does not do this correctly. And Dennis even knows this when he chooses her. He chooses Maureen Hedge. She's a recent widow. And he knew by choosing her, this was crazy. But he thought, if I can pull this off, and I mean really get away with it, that would make me one of the greatest serial killers of all time. And the thought of something greater coming out of another kill, something that would put him into infamous status, offered a different kind of release to Dennis. So now we have the adrenaline building up to having another kill. We haven't we haven't been able to kill somebody in over six years or almost six years. And now I might be prolific. Well hell sign me up because This is going to be a challenge, and what a better way to feed my monster within than with a challenge. However, he needs to set the perfect alibi, and because his son at this point is 10 years old, Dennis Rader is able to nail down the perfect alibi. It is time for his son to attend a Cub Scout camping trip. And he was going as his father and chaperone. And this would cover his tracks so that he would have some time to spend with Marine and finally get some relief that had been building within him over the last six years. Marine Hedge was 53 years old. She was a widow. When she would come home from work, Dennis, if he saw her pass by, would wave. And Marine, she would wave back. It's the neighborly thing to do. Had she known what was going through Dennis Rader's mind, she may not have waved back to him, and she probably would have hightailed it out of the neighborhood. But Dennis was a chameleon. He was a leader in his church. He was considered a pillar in his community. And nobody suspected Dennis of being capable of doing what he did. On April 26th of 1985, Dennis and his son, Brian, head out to a Cub Scout camping trip. Now, as all the boys gather around from Sedgwick County, grill out their hot dogs, sing songs around the campfire, Dennis launches 
his excuse. He goes up to some of the other fathers and he tells them that he has a headache and he's pretty sure the only way he's going to get rid of it if he sleeps it off. And he, you know, he asks him, would you mind watching Brian while I go lay down? And the other dads are like, go for it. We've got it. It's fine. All cool. What they don't notice is after some time of Dennis being sleeping away his headache, he climbs into his vehicle and he leaves. And he drives a little, a little ways down the road and he decides to pull over and change out of his, his Cub Scout uh, clothing or his camping clothing. And he changes into what he calls his hit clothes. And this consists of dark pants, a dark jacket, a watch cap. And for anybody who does not know what that means, it is like a beanie, yet it's more form fitting. There is no extra knitted to the cap. It, it literally, it, if you watched Home Alone, Harry, he wears a watch cap, a very tight form fitting beanie. So that's, that's what that is. I don't know why it just wasn't called a knitted cap, but it's fine. We'll, we'll explain it away and we'll just move on, right? We just won't dwell on this. After Dennis gets changed, he climbs back in. He drives the rest of the way to the bowling alley that's located in northeast Wichita, Kansas. He goes inside. He orders a beer. He never takes a sip of this beer. However, he's about to put on a ploy that he's having the best time drinking, bowling. And as, he, ha, as it progresses, as people are seeing him, he starts to act as though the alcohol is kicking in. Now, before he leaves, Dennis takes that beer that he did not drink. He splashes a little bit on his face. He puts some on his clothing and he starts to smell like a brewery. This is to cover up the fact of how he needs to get to Maureen's home. He can't, it's his neighborhood. He can't drive down it. His wife or anybody could see him and be like, hey, hey, Dennis, what, what, I thought you were camping. He can't do that. He can't do what he has done in the neighborhoods of all of his other victims because people know him. So what does he do? Well, now that he smells like a brewery, he calls cab company, climbs in the cab, puts on the performance of a lifetime, plays this drunk guy that had way too much fun at the bowling alley, and now he's got to go home and face his wife. He gives an address that's located on Independence Street, and they take off. A few block or a few homes, maybe about a block or so from where he's due to be dropped off, he tells the cabbie, you pull over. I I need to get out and walk this off before I go home and my wife sees, you know, I'm I'm not I don't want to hear her nagging. So the cabbie pulls over and they settle up and Dennis takes off walking and the cab pulls away. Once the cab is out of sight, Dennis starts to bolt. He bolts behind the homes and makes his way down to Maureen Hedge's home. Now, once he's there, he gets around to the back and he snips that phone line. Like I said, that's the first thing that he locates when he starts to stalk a woman is where's your house and where's the phone line? Because that's signature to BTK. He learned from Shirley Vianne's house, if he didn't snip it, the phone would ring. And if the phone rang, then his anxiety increased because you never know who's on the other line. Is there somebody coming? Was that phone call to let you know that somebody is coming to your home? Well, I may be out of time. He can't handle that kind of stressor and he does not want to give the victim a chance to call 911. So snip the line. Once he snips the line, he takes a long screwdriver and he pops open the back door. Now, he believes that because Maureen's car is in the driveway, she's home. So he's trying to be as quiet as possible when he enters the home, so not to alert her until he's ready. But once he gets in, he quickly realizes she's not home, and he's like, well, I got time to go through her stuff, and we're going to be looking for things that fit the coat. Remember, scarves, nylons, jewelry, anything he can take as a trophy. While he's in the bedroom searching for things that fit the coat, he hears a car door close out front and he decides, I need to get in the closet quickly. 
So he gets in the closet just as the front door is opening and he hears Maureen talking. And then suddenly he hears a male voice continuing the conversation from his side. And Dennis quickly realizes she's not alone and I didn't plan for this. However, I have my hit kit. It's located in my bowling bag. So it's got my 22 in it. I'll just, I learned from Kevin Brad. I'm not about to try and have another one of those situations. I'm just going to kill him, shoot him dead. So Dennis, he's hunkered down into this closet. He has this game plan. He doesn't want the male to be there, but he'll take care of it, right? But eventually the man says goodbye, gets up, and he leaves Maureen's house. It is after one in the morning and Maureen is finally alone. Dennis stays put in the closet as Maureen gets ready for bed and she climbs in between her sheets and then waits just a few more minutes, giving her ample time to fall asleep. Before he comes out of the closet, he looks down. She seems to be sleeping. Let's see how asleep she really is. He goes across and turns the light on in the bathroom that's adjacent to the bedroom and Maureen doesn't flinch. So Dennis decides... I get to wake her up the way I wanted to. He climbs into bed behind Maureen, and it's that movement in the bed that wakes her up. She's a widow. She has not had her husband in bed with her in a very long time. So to feel the bed move under somebody else's weight, I cannot imagine what, what kind of fear that would invoke inside of me. I would probably pee everywhere just you know because <laughs> that's no so she rolls over looks at Dennis and says what the hell's going on and Dennis takes that moment to climb on top of her wrap his hands around her neck and begin to squeeze now Maureen she's not going down without a fight she struggles against Dennis but Dennis has about 90 pounds on her, and so there's not much of a fight. Eventually, Maureen passes out from the lack of oxygen, and Dennis lets go. He's not going to kill her this way, because that doesn't fit the fantasy. He cuffs her hands behind her back as she's passed out. Then he pulls his belt off, wraps it around her neck, cinching it down, I remember how we talked about this with another victim. His hand pushes the buckle into the neck of his victim while the other hand pulls the rest of the belt tighter and tighter, cinching this garrot style tool to strangle his victim to death. Once Maureen is gone, Dennis decides he needs to continue his search in her home for things. He does dump her purse out on the kitchen table takes her driver's license and the keys to her car. And then Dennis does something he's never done before. He goes and he, get Marine, he gets Marine's body. He removes her nightgown and then he wraps her up inside of the bedding from her bed. Dennis picks up Marine and is surprised at how heavy she is. And he carries her out to her car and stuffs her in, into the trunk of her own car. And he takes off into the night with her. It's after 2 a.m. at this point. He still has a son back at the Cub Scout camp that he's not there chaperoning. Don't forget, Brian is still located in the woods with a group of Cub Scouts. He pulls into the church Yes, I said the church. Um, he is a leader within his church and he has keys to the building because he is trustworthy or comes across that way. And so Dennis takes Maureen out of the trunk of the car, lays her along this tree line close to the, to the church building. And that way her body's kind of hidden by all that, uh, by the trees and all of that. He goes into the church, goes down to the basement, and he starts to hang black trash bags over the windows. He thumbtacks them up, and once he's sure that he's got every window 
covered, he turns the lights on and goes outside. And he, he, it worked. Nobody can see the light from the basement windows thanks to the black trash bags. So he picks up Maureen's body and he carries her down to the, to the basement and unwraps her from the sheets. Dennis ties her with some stockings and nylons. He throws some high heels on her body and he begins to tie her into different positions and poses her for the camera because he is taking photographs after changing her position and tying her in different ways. Dennis does this for three hours and he uses items he brought with him, props, gags, whatever, to help give him essentially spank bank material. Once he sees that the sun is starting to peek over the horizon, Dennis realizes he's out of time. He has to clean the church up. He has to clean himself up. He has to get rid of Marine's body, and he has to make it back over to Cub Scouts before 730, when the other dads are probably going to start getting up and getting breakfast ready for the boys. So, Dennis unties Marine, picks her up, wraps her back in her blankets and stuff, and stuffs her back into the trunk. He goes down, removes the trash bags from the windows, and kind of cleans up the church as best as he can for right now. He's going to come back and finish up. He goes upstairs, jumps in behind the wheel of Marine's car, and they take off. Now, close to the church in Park City, there's a culvert. And that culvert is known to everybody within the community as a place to dump dead animals. And Dennis realizes this could be a perfect place to dump her as seeing her laying out there, you might miss, see what you're seeing and think it's an animal instead of a body. So once he gets out to this, this culvert and he gets Maureen out of the, out of the trunk of the car, he unwraps her body from the blankets, carries her down to the brush line and covers Maureen's body with brush and branches and things like that. She's less noticeable, which means it could take longer before anybody finds her body. Dennis climbs back up to where the car is parked on the side of the road and immediately realizes he's locked the keys in the car. Smooth move, right? So Dennis goes, he finds a rock, comes over, and he smashes the windshield. Okay, we're going to take a pause right here real quick because when I'm thinking I've locked some keys in the car and virtually the only way is if I take a window out, I'm not going to take out the, the windshield for the simple fact that I have seen people be pulled over because their windshield is broken. And I would think just off the top of my head, if I had just disposed of a body, the last thing I want to do is draw attention from any police and giving them a reason to pull me over. However, me and Dennis, we're not on the same line. He smashes out the windshield. And from what I can gather, I cannot find very clear photographs of Maureen's car. But I don't think the entire windshield busted out. I think he just broke it enough to get his arm in and get the keys out of the ignition and let himself into the car. So once he does this, he drives Maureen's car back to the bowling alley where his car is currently parked. And it's time to get back to Cub Scouts. Now that Dennis has everything cleaned up, he's disposed of Maureen's body, he's disposed of her car, he gets in his car at the bowling alley and heads back to the campsite before anybody can see that he's actually missing, and he makes it back. Nobody realizes that Dennis ever left the campsite. They assumed he was in his tent sleeping off his headache all night. Now, that same day, Maureen doesn't show up for her job, and this is a job that she has been at work every single day she was scheduled. They say she never missed a day. So when she doesn't show up, this concerns her supervisor and her supervisor calls Marine's son-in-law, Rod Hook. And he, 
you know, they talk. Maureen's not here. She hasn't called in. This isn't like her. I think something's wrong. Rod drives over to Maureen's house, and as he's pulling up, he realizes her car's not there. So he just doesn't stop. He just assumes she's not home, and he, he'll he figure out what's going on with his mother-in-law as soon as he can get her on the phone. On April 28th of 1985, the very next day after talking with Maureen's supervisor, Rod still hasn't heard from his mother-in-law. So he decides, let's call Park City Police Department and let them know what's going on. Hopefully it's nothing, but just in case. So he tells them, you know, his mother-in-law has missed work now for two days. This is out of character for her. He drove by the day before. She wasn't home. And now he's starting to really get worried because nobody has heard from her. So Rod goes over with an officer to 6254 Independent Street to do a welfare check on Marine. There is a good chance that Dennis is at his house at 6220, just up the road, watching this happen, knowing exactly where she is. At the house, Rod notices at the back door, it had been jimmied open. And now he's sure somebody has broke into his mother-in-law's house. Park City Police Department does something that inhibits connecting Marine with BTK. They label her as simply missing, even though there's evidence in her home to prove somebody entered her home without permission. Now, back in Wichita at the police department, Police Chief Richard Lemunion has assembled what he has called the Ghostbusters. This is a group of men who come highly recommended by their supervisors or by performance. There's, they're people that know of the BTK case, but they have not actually worked the case. And he calls them his group of fresh eyes. He's hoping by bringing these people in, we can find something that's been staring us right in the face the whole time. So we have Captain Gary Fulton, Lieutenant Al Stewart, Officer Paul Dotson, Officer Ed Nezaz, Officer Mark Richardson, Officer Jerry Harper, Officer Kenny Landwer, and Officer Paul Holmes. And the way this group has been broken up, it's two detectives per BTK case. So we've got two at the Oterios. We've got them working that crime scene. We've got two for the Vianne murders. They're working that. We have two for the Fox murder. And we have two that have taken on the Bright murder and the Williams attempted BTK murder. And it's tying the Brights in is really hard because Kevin Bright claims he was tied up and then he broke free but was shot in the face twice with a 22 in close range by Dennis Rader. His sister, Kathy, she was tied up who also broke free and Dennis knew that he had very little time left because Kevin had left the home after being shot twice in the face to go get some help. So he just wildly stabs her. Neither one of them have ligature marks around their necks. There was no attempt at strangulation with either one of them. So tying that murder into BTK is a shot in the dark. They're right. We know that. We're looking back. We know they're right. But at the time, they're not sure. So we've got two. We broke this team up. Two are working on each case individually. Park City does not notify Wichita PD or the Ghostbuster team of what they have found at Hedge's home. Had they notified them, there's a great chance they would have blew it off because the victimology isn't there. Park City had not seen a hit from BTK. Anna Williams and Marine Hedge were both quite a bit older than previous victims. And if it was BTK, 
then he is evolving and the police need to switch gears in order to hunt Dennis Rader down. In the end, it doesn't matter. They're never notified of Marine Hedge. Even though there's, there's a break-in, she's missing, the phone lines are cut. There's things there, but they're not there enough because she's outside the age range and she's outside geographically of where he likes to hunt. On May 2nd of 1985, Hedge's car is found in the bowling alley parking lot where Dennis dumped it before switching into his own vehicle. The windshield is broken and it's obvious that the car has been broken into. The windshield's broken. Evidence enough. Now, Locksmith, he comes out and he pops the trunk for the Park City PD. And inside they find two bed covers, a purple bedspread, a tan curtain, and a pink electric Sears blanket. This is the all of the bedding that when they went into Maureen Hedge's home and her bed had nothing on it, this is what was missing. They found it, but they still have no idea where Maureen is. Just a few days later, on May 5th of 1985, Park City Police Chief Ace Van Way and one of the city's animal control officers go out to the culvert, the culvert where it is known by everybody in the community as a place to dump dead animals. This is a shot in the dark, but they take it. And this is just a precaution that just pans out for them. There, under the brush and under the branches, they find Marine Hedge's body. Autopsy will later confirm that she died by way of strangulation. We have a victim that's been strangled. At her home, she was missing bedding, and her back door was broken into, and her phone line was cut. We have a few markers pointing to BTK, but... This happened in Park City, and it happened to a woman who was 53 years old. She's outside his victimology and outside of his profile geographically. They don't tie her to BTK just yet. Dennis Rader is an anomaly to everything that the FBI's behavioral unit had learned about serial killers thus far. If you've seen... If you've seen or heard of John Douglas, you know what kind of investigation went into starting the FBI's behavioral unit. They went out and they spoke to serial killers on, in, on their own time and they didn't stop until they had an idea of what a serial killer was made of. And at this point, Dennis Rader completely obliterates all of that research. He does not fall in any kind of the research that had been done. He is able to lay dormant. His victimology has changed. You know, he's he doesn't have the characteristics of the triad, the serial killer triad. He, you know, he didn't wet the bed. He he did kill animals by hanging them, so that was a little different. And it's never proven that the relationship he had with his mother was a bad one, but he also didn't play with fire. So he had one out of three. Doesn't mean it's, he's, you know, he impossible for him to become a serial killer because it is possible he is a serial killer. He is currently serving time for the murders he's committed. But Dennis just didn't fit in this nice packaged box like most serial killers had when the behavioral unit got a hold of him. Okay. Dennis said when he first communicated with law enforcement that serial killers wouldn't stop until they are dead or caught. But he went four years between murders. He went an additional six years after Nancy Fox until the time that he kills Marine Hedge. His ability to control the monster inside, as he likes to call it, defies all notion, defies the premise that once you start to feed that monster, it becomes all-consuming. We see that. 
if you look at the evolution of Ted Bundy, we're not going to get into great detail. It's a case that we'll cover later. But if you look at that, with each murder, he, he his need to kill again becomes more and more prominent to the point that he's on the lam in Florida and he makes this bull rush through this sorority house and just ravishes these poor young college girls. That is essentially the end point of the monster inside of a serial killer. It becomes all-consuming until you do something stupid and get yourself caught or killed. We watched Ted Bundy do that. You know he did that. We watched Jeffrey Dahmer do it. We watched John Wayne Gacy. We see this pattern time and time again, except with Dennis Rader. We don't see that. And that is the part that is the, the big, that is what we're all addicted to in finding out why he is this way. They, we need to know. We need to understand why he is the way he is. But Dennis, I think when you tear him apart and you look at him um, detail by detail, what you're going to find is a man who who really in touch with his self-control side. And all-consuming, well, it didn't come in the form of committing some mass murder, mass spree real quick before he gets caught. He gets cocky and he wants credit where credit's due. And that's how we see him come down. He does not allow the desire for gratification, for relief. He doesn't allow that to, to overtake him. There is only one other person I, I think we can compare with BTK, and that's Gary Ridgway, uh, the Green River Killer. He, he had a span of about 21 years um, before he was caught. That's shy of BTK's 30 years of terror, but, I mean, in comparison, you can see it. Let's look at his victimology, okay? With each victim, they were within a five-mile radius of each other until Marine Hedge, okay? This five-mile radius between the Oterios, the Brights, the Vians, the Fox, that radius is only eight miles away from where Dennis Rader and his family live. They live in just a small suburb just right there outside of Wichita City Limits. So for him to commit these murders in this hunting ground, that's, that's not something we considered or could consider impossible. It's completely possible. Another thing we can look at is his victim's age. They range from 21, which Kathy Bright was his youngest victim, all the way up to 39, which was Joe Otero. Now, if we just do the females, we go from 11 to 34. Both Josie was 11 and Julie Otero was 34 years old. And it's, it matches until we get to Anna Williams. And that's why when investigators were looking into why Dennis picked her and found that her granddaughter, 24 years old, would come to the home and stay with her frequently, that's why investigators thought, she's, he's not after Anna, he's after the granddaughter. Well, no. Dennis was after Anna. The granddaughter, she would just been an added bonus. Marine Hedge, she was 53. So you've got Anna Williams, 63. Marine Hedge, that's 53. And those two completely obliterate this victimology, right? We can't, investigators can't wrap their heads around why Dennis changed their age and where he was geographically with Marine Hedge. It seems as though you can look at it this way. As Dennis aged, his victim's age, right? But generally, when Dennis was young, he chose younger victims. Dennis was only 40 when he killed Marine, so that puts her 13 years older than him. So not necessarily as he ages does his victim's age, and 
next week we'll talk about a victim that would completely obliterate this idea anyways. All of his victims, with the exception of Kathy Bright, were strangled with nylons or the belt, garrote kind of style. And his way of killing did not change. Had he brought his own materials to the Kathy Bright uh, murders, he says confidently that if he had his own tools, they would not, ha- the whole scene would not have gone down that way. He would have been able to maintain control. However, he was inexperienced. He thought he could find what he needed within the home. And it just didn't work. It didn't work at all. His nerves still were a part of the anticipation. Therefore, he made, he made mistake after mistake after mistake. Okay, so outside of Kathy Bright, we cannot put Kathy Bright and her murder as a definitive way for for Dennis Rader at all. She her murder was nothing compared. I mean, not one damn thing went his way that entire time. So to put that up there in comparison, it, it just fails. But. When Dennis had gone six years and he decided if he could pull off a murder within his own community, that would make him infamous, everything changed. Maureen was 53. She was in his neighborhood. She was houses away from him. There's no semen found. She was older, but she did live at home alone. And he moved the body for the first time and he took it to a church where he proceeded to pose her nude body in various bindings. And this was just to help maintain sexual gratification beyond the the killing itself. Okay, so we have investigators, we have this victimology, we have a hunting ground, we kind of see where he wants, we have this one that occurred that could kind of fall within BTK, except for a couple, you know, details, and those are enough for us to not consider it just yet. So investigators, they're working every lead possible to a certain degree. Any male that lived within a quarter mile of the hunting ground or the killing zone or whatever you want to call it, they were looked at and they were questioned. Now, evidence had been collected for the last 10 years. We started in 1974 with the Otero murders. Everything had been collected and boxed away. And now it's all scattered because 10-year-old cases don't have priority. So they don't stay within the area that they can be immediately accessed. They're boxed away and put in the basement, right? So now this Ghostbuster team, they have got to put together all of this evidence because now we know they're all kind of connected. We need to get all the evidence, get it together, get it cataloged, and let's look at it. So Officer Paul Holmes of the Ghostbuster squad, he begins collecting all this evidence and he starts the, the tedious process of cataloging it. And, and there's case files, there's, there's toys from the Vian home, thousands of pages of reports, five boxes that hold just detective notes. And you've seen it in the movie. They have that little flip notebook and they're writing things down. Imagine five boxes full of that. That is a lot for them to have to sift through catalog and, and, and look at this in some sort of organized manner. There's no system in place when they started working the BTK killing. They are making the system as they go. The Ghostbusters were put into place because Lemonian needed help hunting down this serial killer. And what they all needed to do was sit down and read page after page of case file reports and notes. That's where they all had to start. And that's tedious. I can imagine going through that kind of paperwork. But then again, I don't. You, my research for each case seems to grow. But this gave them an, uh, the ability to kind of get an understanding of what happened at each crime scene. 
And that could reveal the secret that they had been looking for this whole time. At least that's what Lemunian was hoping for. But Dennis was very careful about leaving behind anything that could identify him. If you'll remember way back to episode one with the Otero murders, he had dropped one of his hunting knives he had brought with him in his hit kit. And he got all the way down to where his car was in Dylan's groceries and decided he had to go back for that, which means he had to put his car at the crime scene. But nobody realized he was there. He got out, ran, got his knife, got away. Nobody ever identified his vehicle being there. So that's the only slip up he had. Now we're not talking, we're not including the Bright murders at all. That entire scene is chaotic. And for whoever had the the duty of sifting through that and, and putting some kind of chronological order going on, that that was, I mean, now looking back, you, you wouldn't think it's that hard. However, we that's because somebody back in that time, back in that investigation, did the work for us, okay? That, for them to have somebody working that murder in the Ghostbuster squad, that was a brilliant thing, okay? Because it didn't fit anything of Dennis Schrader yet. They still stuck it with it. However, Maureen Hedge had several markers that fit with BTK, but because she was in Park City and she was older, she didn't get listed, not yet. Now, we're talking about the investigation, okay? And I said Dennis Rader was very careful about leaving behind things that he could be identified with. However, we do know he's left behind DNA evidence in the past. I mean, there's semen that was found next to Josie Otero. There's semen that was found with Shirley Vianne. We have biological evidence, but in 1985, DNA testing is literally just getting up off the ground and running. We actually will not see it used to successfully convict anybody till like 1987. So they have it, and now we have this DNA. So the Ghostbusters head out and they start collecting as many DNA samples from men within the Wichita area that they can. And they only get about 6% out of 100,000 men. So 6,000 men who voluntarily hand over DNA. For DNA, for those who are working in identifying DNA, to, to run a cross-examination with it, okay? so. When DNA testing started, you had to have quite a bit of a sample. Now, today, if you smoke a cigarette, throw the butt down, we can get that butt. And there's enough DNA in there now for technology to get a perfect match or 99.999% match. Um, back then, it, it, you had to be careful because we can test 100,000 men. However, due to the sample size, we're gonna run out of the biologic left at crime scene. Therefore, it wasn't ideal, okay? Here's the other thing. Now, DNA is in a database. If you have committed any kind of crime and you left behind any kind of DNA and, and your DNA was subpoenaed, you're in this, this big, big bad catalog that's in the cloud and if DNA is found at a crime scene and they run it and it matches you it's right there in the system they didn't have that in 1985 so if Dennis Rader never gave a sample they were never going to find a match there wasn't some magic machine that just ran consistently until a match was found so again Dennis Rader slipped through their fingers and they're left with nothing. What was collected and cataloged, like I said, it proved to not be enough. The team was no closer to knowing who BTK was than they were before the squad was assembled. 
there was nothing. We didn't, we just didn't have anything. And Dennis was careful. And because we were just now starting to see advancement in forensic criminology and in forensic investigation, we don't have a lot to go on. And be, if, if Dennis would have been active in the 90s into the 2000s, I don't know if he would have got such a big reign of terror. I don't think we would have 30 years with him. I think he would have been caught fairly quickly, um, especially being naive and stupid enough to leave behind body fluid. So DNA is not getting us anywhere with the investigation. They've gone through, they've cataloged, they've organized. There, There's nothing there, okay? So now they turn to people who've been arrested for peeping toms, for exposing themselves in public. Anyone who has been identified as one to a, a impersonate a police officer or detective. And they're looking into other burglaries in Southeast Wichita. I have a very hard time with that word. So you will hear me enunciate it very slowly. Once they've done this, I mean, still no closer. So the next thing that detectives decide to do is call up the phone company and look at the reports of telephone wires that had been clipped in the Wichita area. When they got the results back, it was far more than they ever anticipated. Now, as they're comparing these, these complaints that their phone lines have been cut to the area that BTK has been known to hunt and kill in, they get a hit. It's on a house that's just a few homes down from Shirley Vianne. And remember, her young son, Stephen, had, had seen Dennis walk up to this house and knock on the door before Stephen went into his own home where Dennis would later come and knock on the door. So we have a potential lead. But once they start investigating it, they hit a brick wall and, and they're left with nothing again. So Ghostbusters, they're on their way. They're advancing as quick as they can as technology allows them to. They're trying to do everything in their power to, to catching BTK. And so... Now we have this ability to look at computerized data. So they start to pull different reports. They get patrons who were active borrowers from the Wichita Public Library. They get a list of uh, WSU student and faculty. They get with the phone company, get a list of employees. They get with Dylan's Grocery, list of employees. They look at uh, careers that would virtually allow somebody to come into the home. Plumbers, window installers, natural gas company. They seem to obtain records for any service that would have that legitimate reason except for burglar alarm installers. What did Dennis Rader do for a profession? He installed security systems with ADT. And since they didn't, didn't pull the employee list for that, there goes Dennis Rader right through those fingertips again. Now, with Shaw PD, they have gone and spoke with FBI in the past. They're trying to, they're trying every angle possible. They're stumped. And in the, at the end of the day, this is pissing them off. You know, we have body after body coming up and we have nothing to show for it. We are no closer to solving the case than we were in 1974 with the murders of the Otero family. And the FBI, they're working at rounding up details on other criminals who have done some bondage homicides. This is all in an effort to try and help Wichita PD because... FBI can see the severity of this situation and, and we're going to work together. We're going to get this figured out. And with all this data they're pulling from all these different homicides, they're putting together a behavioral profile for BTK. And 
I'm going to share with you that profile now. The attached analysis is only as good as the information that has been provided. In addition, it may be necessary to totally change or modify this analysis and new information is developed, such as additional victims, more forensic evidence, or more information obtained from research. Multiple homicides, Wichita, Kansas. The murders of the offender known to the public only as the BTK are the result of fantasy acted out where... For the first time in his life, he is in a position of dominant. He is an inadequate type, a nobody, who through his crimes, he placed himself in a position of importance. BTK Strangler is now a somebody who is receiving the recognition he feels is long overdue. He is not very original in his crimes. He has patterned himself after other killers such as the son of Sam in New York City. Most of the verbiage used by the offender in his letters probably comes out of recent publications of detective magazines. The subject is alienated, lonely, and withdrawn. He would not be expected to have any lasting relationship with others and would lead a solitary existence dominated by fantasy and magical thinking. His killings is an attempt on the part to find affection and acceptance. He fears everyone, including himself. He would not be expected to have any normal relations with women, probably has never had a normal heterosexual relationship with one. When he is not killing, he is experiencing intense feelings that he is not normal, and therefore he kills to cope with this disorder and attempt to escape within his own fantasies. Thus he can be expected to kill again. And to do so in a compulsive, repetitious pattern he has already established. His victims can be either male or female who are both loved and outgoing. His victims will be in a position of vulnerability where he can totally render them helpless. His victims represent his own feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. His own life has been disruptive. He probably comes from a background where his family was broken. He was raised by an overbearing mother who was inconsistent in her discipline. His father was absent either because of marital separation or death. This would have occurred when he was a youth. Your subject may have been raised by foster parents. Your subject was an average student in the classroom. However, he's more adept to disrupting the class by using profanity and pranks. His language statements make us believe that he has some military experience and or is a police buff. He probably has had run-ins with the police in the past, such as assault or breaking and entering. During these break-ins, items taken will be items of insignificance. These items would have been taken because of a fetish or to feed a strong urge to take an article of clothing or an item that he is fond of or the satisfaction of committing a crime that will leave little evidence to investigators. BTK may have a history of voyeuristic activities, and he may have an arrest record for these types of offenses. He hunts his victims by selecting neighborhoods where he can pursue different houses without being detected. Furthermore, his victims will live in an area where, if he need be, he can have an easy escape route, such as a neighborhood park where he can hide to elude the police. His killings are impulsively motivated without elaborate planning. He seeks out targets of opportunity. Such individuals of this type suffer from insomnia and thus find it difficult to hold steady employment. Control of himself and of his environment is essential to such a person. Although he is gaining in confidence, he is still shy, withdrawn, and isolated. As a counter-strategy technique, your department must not make any statements concerning the killer's mental condition. Do not allow the media to label him as some kind of psychotic killer. If they have already done so, your best strategy will be to align yourself with the killer 
and not the psychiatric experts. Any press releases should clearly state that he is a killer that must be apprehended and that he is not a psychotic animal. This approach may reduce the killer's anxiety and reinforce his own guilt feelings. This removing any psychiatric excuses for his acts and leaving him responsible for his murders. Extended periods between his murders may be for a reason when he was absent from the area, either as a result of military service, schooling, incarceration, or mental treatment. It is not uncommon for subjects such as yours to frequent police hangouts and attempt to overhear officers discussing the case. Such offenders may be at the crime scene observing detectives investigating the case. All of this allows the murderer to fulfill his ego and gain a feeling of superiority. He may go so far to telephonically contact your department and provide details specific to his crimes. Your advantage in this case is his very strong self-centered attitude, which will be his downfall. He will provide information to a friend or an acquaintance at a local tavern concerning information he knows about the case. He may even pretend to be an officer working the case. He may carry a fake badge of, on his person. If so, he may use this to gain entry into his victim's homes. BTK will continue to kill until he is caught or killed. A decade into his reign of terror, and we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg with Dennis Rader. His ability to slip through the fingers of everyone chasing him is daunting, but with advancements in the forensic evidence side of investigating, detectives have a new hope that they can calm the fears of the people in their community who rush in after being away and pick up their receiver to see if their phone line had been cut. With the special task force under hush orders, the work going into each crime scene and victim of the infamous BTK leaves Chief Lemunyan with his fingers crossed that fresh eyes will see something that has been staring them right in the face all along. That is, until BTK goes and switches up his victimology. Now communication has gone silent and Dennis Rader gets up the nerve and pushes his luck with his killings by picking off one in his own neighborhood. But when rumors suggest that her new boyfriend killed her, his voice perks up and shuts them down. No one was going to get the credit for the work he did. Life moves along and so does Dennis, only he isn't going to let life cause another six-year gap in between releases and a young mother has caught his eye. Time to throw investigators for another loop and hopefully earn him another perfect hit. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight and don't forget to head over to the True Crime Librarian on Facebook or Instagram and hit subscribe so you never miss an update from the librarian or about any of the cases that we are covering. As always, I will leave you with one last line. Nothing matters but the facts. Without them, the science of criminal investigation is nothing more than a guessing game. Much love, the true crime librarian. <laughs>